So, uh, Dr. Dimitris and the attendees, we will start the session in uh, one minute. Uh, Dimitri is just a test of sound and video. Can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear you. Excellent. Thank I can you. See. So we'll start in, uh, in 30 seconds. We really want to thank uh, all the attendees for being with us today. Uh, thank you all for your time. And at any time, you are more than welcome to ask questions using uh, the Q&A section of Zoom. And your questions will be addressed uh, before the end of the session today. So we are, uh, we're clear to start. Um, yeah, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for taking the time to uh, attend today's presentation. Um, I'm pleased to be here with uh, Dr. Dimitri Sagrotis from the Charlton Group. Uh, we are uh, strategically uh, partnering with the Charlton Group uh, for uh, automotive activities. Uh, the Charlton Group is a leader in automotive manufacturing and uh, has uh, strategic uh, you know, investments and endeavors working with Dura Automotive, Shiloh Industries, and many others. So our presentation today, uh, my presentation today, will focus on the digital journey um, and will kind of take us through a tour of the digital tools of the trade, uh, starting with connecting the factory floor to uh, metrics and visibility and transparency on the factory floor, uh, to the execution from the shop floor to the top floor business systems, and the role of industrial artificial intelligence and predictive analytics uh, to assist companies to, uh, to drive towards uh, the vision of our company, actually. And if I go here, you'll see the vision in a very simple statement. Uh, you know, we partner uh, and collaborate with manufacturing organizations and help them uh, drive towards a zero downtime, zero defect manufacturing operation. Uh, our DNA is the automotive industry. Um, we've been working in automotive for many years. You know, I personally and many of our team members uh, come uh, from an automotive background. And uh, you can uh, see some of the logos that we work with. Uh, recently, we started a partnership with Hino Motors, uh, which is a Toyota company, to do digital transformation of the whole operation. Um, uh, Train Technologies has also partnered with IoT company uh, for predictive maintenance of, uh, of their enterprise, including uh, key assets. Um, such as hydraulic presses that are used to make uh, compressor systems. And we as a company, we, uh, we excel in two domains. We, we excel in using analytics within the factory for uh, smart connected operations to drive zero downtime and zero defect vision. But uh, we also are uh, growing our smart product domain uh, where we are using analytics to, uh, to improve um, the... Uh, usability, okay, and the uptime and the uh, customer satisfaction and experience of using products. Those products could be um, uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, they could be uh, pumps in the field, they could be gearboxes, they could be jet engines, okay. So the analytics are actually the same, but the domain of experience and the user um, ROI is different. From a practices perspective, uh, we are a team of consultants, um, analytical data scientists, and IoT engineers, okay? So we have built our company around three practices. The core practice is uh, providing predictive analytics solution to manufacturing. That's our core practice. And I will uh, go through this towards the end of the presentation, our PDX product. And uh, in addition to that, uh, we provide consulting assessments and training focusing on industry 4.0. And uh, at the same time, we provide a turnkey solution for uh, getting connected, um, uh, visibility on the floor using OEE metrics, uh, as well as manufacturing execution systems. So a, a seasoned team of consultants, data scientists, and IoT engineers uh, to provide everyone um, a turnkey solution, depending on the level of digital maturity within the operation. So uh, let's start our journey today. Um, there's really four things to the presentation. Um, the first piece is around 
uh, defining some terminology of uh, how we perceive the industrial IoT sector and Industry 4.0 as an initiative driving uh, digital transformation. And then I will go through several digital tools of the trade, okay? What tools do you need to uh, get your digital transformation journey accelerated and how you can start today? And I do wanna give a small introduction to a analytics product that we recently introduced during uh, the pandemic, which is not focusing on machines, but it is focusing on people. It is about employee health and wellness and the use of analytics uh, to ensure um, you know, smarter and safer access to manufacturing plants, okay? Let's start. Um, so let's start our journey by talking about uh, IoT. You know, IoT is uh, by no means a new field, actually. It might be a new naming, uh, but, uh, but we have been monitoring uh, critical and uh, kind of people sensitive assets for many years, uh, including uh, power generation, um, including, um, you know, airplanes and the trains and the things of that sort, which are usually safety critical. And uh, over the years, um, especially in the past few years, this has accelerated in the industrial sector. So within the industrial IoT space, within factories, basically, um, there is usually a, a four layer pyramid, okay? We, we call that the automation pyramid. It is actually a standard by ISA 95. You have machines, you have your CNCs, your PLCs, your sensors. Um, you have uh, SCADA, which are your data acquisition systems that might be present, might, might not be present, depends. You have usually a manufacturing execution system that is tying your factory floor to the ERP layer, which is your business system, your SAP, your Info, your Oracle, and so on. Um, the, the current situation in industry is, in many cases, those layers are fragmented. They are siloed. They are not connected to each other. Uh, some of them might be present, some of them might not be present. In, in many manufacturers today, there is surely a machine layer and, a, and an ERP system in most cases, but the data acquisition and the MES layers are either uh, lacking or there's a gap or they're just not, not in place, okay? Um, therefore, uh, right here, the Industry 4.0 initiative was actually formed, okay, to realize um, the IT OT convergence, the convergence between information technology, your top floor, and OT, your operational technology, your machines, your parts, your people, your assets. Okay. But to make that convergence happen, a strategy is required. And we uh, work through our IoT Academy to provide a digital and analytics strategy. We partner with the VP manufacturing, uh, VP operations. Um, a COO, a chief information officer, chief digital officer, you know, a steering committee set of people to provide um, a strategy around four areas. And I would actually start from the right and go backwards. What is the business case? We usually start with the business case. What is the ROI? What is the financial justification that would allow you to uh, embark on this journey? Okay. And knowing the business case allows us to drive the technology. Business case dictates technology adoption and implementation. So then we look at what is the readiness? What's the connectivity readiness of the organization, right? Um, I got new machines, I got old machines. Um, I need sensors on the floor. I need gateway hardware because my machines are you know, 40 to 50 years old, right? So what is the connectivity readiness and how can I create a data lake, okay? Once the data lake is created, right, and, and we have a team that does that, we're able to start implementing analytics on the floor. There are performance analytics that we will talk about, such as visibility metrics and production monitoring, overall equipment effectiveness in real time. And there are predictive analytics using AI and machine learning to go beyond. It is not historical data. It is now looking at future behavior of the machine and the factory operation. So performance analytics, predictive analytics. Um, and then we have technology, okay? Uh, technology is key. Um, you know, what is the infrastructure required behind it? What is the architecture required behind it? How can I start in one cell, in one plant, knowing that I need to scale this to 50 more cells in my plant and maybe another 50 plants in six continents, right? So uh, think big, start small. We will discuss a standard approach, systematic approach 
to implement digital transformation today to realize Industry 4.0, focusing on these four key pillars uh, of a digital strategy. So let's start with the business case. Um, it all starts with the business case. But before going into the business case, it's important to understand, you know, thinking things from the end. What, what do I want to achieve, right? And if we just look at Industry 4.0, um, we have a, a very simple definition, actually, of what Industry 4.0 does. And you can kind of, you know, see it at the top there. It is combining traditional manufacturing practices with the technological world, okay? Um, you know, folks have evolved from, uh, from the looms to the assembly lines uh, to, the, to the PLCs. But in many cases, some manufacturers are, are still stuck in an industry 3.0 era, and they're looking for ways to start getting more value from the expensive assets on the factory floor, from the PLCs, from the CNCs, which in many cases are intelligent equipment that have ethernet ports, they have serial ports, and the data is available. It's residing in the PLC and it just requires connectivity, right? So connectivity allows us to transform from an industry 3.0 setting to an industry 4.0 setting. Um, you know, the, the German Fraunhofer Institute who, recent, who introduced actually industry 4.0 initially as a German initiative um, and has grown now uh, globally, um, they define a concept of a cyber physical system uh, cyber being your IT world, physical being your physical assets, and how we can mirror the cyber and the physical world to achieve um, a, a digital twin and a, a way to model the analytics and behavior of an asset, right? Throughout its whole digital thread, from design to manufacturing to aftermarket and then to redesign, right? So how do we transform the organization from industry 3.0 to industry 4.0? We have to first think about the business case. Why do I want to transform? What is your why, right? And it's important to understand the challenges first that you need to go through. So I'm going to start with uh, with the bad news and then go to the good news. The bad news is understand your challenges. There are challenges. It is not an easy journey and it is not an overnight journey. It starts by understanding where are our weaknesses, right? And the weaknesses are usually around technology, but also process and people. Right. Technology, process, and people is actually a perfect recipe for success in your industry 4.0 journey. So if we take technology as a start, right, you have IT systems. Those IT systems in many cases may not have been well deployed. They might be aging. They might be old. Uh, green screen ERP systems, right? So how can I integrate with such systems? There are ways to integrate with such systems uh, without having to uh, you know, pay expensive upgrades, right? To upgrade your ERP system. So there are ways. On the plant floor, the shop floor, um, dumb equipment, but very capable equipment, right? Very capable equipment still being used on the factory floor today, uh, but they are old. They don't have ethernet ports. So how can I communicate with this equipment? There are ways and we will share that with you. And then when going into people, you have the, um, very senior operators that are graduating and uh, retiring, and you have the digital natives that are incoming, right, who are uh, well versed with technology and the folks with knowledge, you know, leaving who are less versed with technology, right? So how can I start balancing training those digital natives and the uh, good tribal knowledge that is leaving my company today? I was shocked to find out that at, at one of the largest OEMs making jet engines uh, today, the average age of an operator on the on the plant floor is about 55 years old. Okay, that is a fact. So when such a person who's accumulated 40 per, 40 plus years of experience graduating, and digital natives coming with uh, near zero years of experience, how can I use technology and connected workforce, right, connected workforce applications to kind of marry this knowledge so it's not lost, right? And then processes. We're introducing technologies, the HMI, the human machine interfacing, uh, must be intuitive, must be meaningful. I cannot have a, um, uh, a, a maintenance engineer using a predictive analytics product, and this person is not a PhD, this person is not a data scientist. So we're expecting intuitive user experience that allows operators, maintenance, and every role within the manufacturing organization to use these tools and implement them in their daily processes and daily lives. 
And I put this one at the bottom because if, if there's a good business case put in place, funding would not be an issue. Um, in addition to access to capital that is available in many, many different states, uh, including the state of South Carolina and others, where they have very strong manufacturing extension uh, partnership programs that are actually able to fund these initiatives given the business case, right? So what is the business case? Uh, you know, we need to understand the why um, before embarking on the how and the what and the when. The why is critical for success. And the why always revolves around metrics, right? What metrics do you need to improve? Um, overall equipment effectiveness is a key metric. And if, if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it, right? So how can we start having real-time connectivity and visibility on the factory floor? This is the beginning. Real-time visibility and connectivity allows you to see the impact of using data, using analytics on improving your uptime, improving your labor productivity, transitioning from a paper-based manufacturing mindset to a less paper, paperless manufacturing mindset, right? that improves labor productivity significantly on the factory floor. And then going into predictive maintenance, once I start using advanced analytics on my factory floor, I can reduce unplanned maintenance, uh, um, unplanned downtime significantly. Um, in automotive, uh, an automotive OEM, a Japanese OEM, we used to run lines at 95% OEE, but the 1% or one minute of downtime was costing you know, tens of thousands of dollars, right? So how can I take that 95% OEE and sustain a high level of OEE in my operation and improve that even fractionally from 95 to 96%? Think about your one minute of downtime on your factory floor and the ability to use analytics to shift away from a reactive mode and, and a time-based mode of doing maintenance to a predictive and preventive mode of doing maintenance using real-time data, connectivity, and analytics. And then you have the impact to other systems within your company, okay? How can I take predictive data and use it to reduce spare part inventory on my factory floor? Um, many of our clients were keeping very large amounts of spare parts, waiting for machines to fail. Uh, we had a client looking at spindle bearing predictive maintenance. Each spindle bearing is around thirty to $40,000 in cost, and they had 100 CNCs so just imagine the cost of inventory that was sitting in a warehouse waiting for a spindle to fail until they fix it. So now how can I do predictive replenishment of spare parts? How can I reduce spare part inventory and by predicting the need for a spindle bearing, just in time replacement and ordering it from the OEM so that I can fix the machine before it fails and, and request a spare part before the machine goes down. So the link to maintenance spare parts is in many ways underestimated, but it is a strong ROI for many companies. Um, not to mention optimizing the schedule, optimizing maintenance schedules, the PM schedule, optimizing labor by knowing which part of the machine to fail and when to fix it. You do not need multiple maintenance people. You can find the right person with the right skill set just in time to fix the machine before it actually fails. We have clients that have um, significantly optimized their, their MTTR, their mean time to repair um, critical parts of their machine and eliminated overhead maintenance, eliminated the need to do firefighting on a Saturday or Sunday and had a very optimized, uh, synchronized maintenance schedule from a Monday through Friday perspective during the working hours. You know? So this was all maintenance uptime related. I will also touch on at the end predictive quality and the opportunity in uh, scrap rich areas of the factory, like casting and injection molding to correlate machine process data with quality data that's coming off the machine, whether it's image data or whether it's quality parameters and actually predict and prescribe that you're gonna make a bad aluminum cast, for example, and feed that data back to the machine. So you don't need an operator. It's a lights out operation. We prescribe to the machine that you're gonna make a good part or you're gonna make a bad part. And you auto part segregate, the machine is commanded to immediately segregate the part in a good bin or a reject bin. But to do all this, right? There has to be a way to start. And the way to start is actually to get connected, okay? Everyone needs real-time data on the factory floor. 
the first step is understand what is your digital maturity okay before i go into the tools what is the digital maturity of your plant right and we have an approach to do that our iot academy runs assessments we call them digital assessments they vary based on the size of the plant from one day to three days and during the assessment we bring the right resources from our three practices our industry 4.0 consultant our connectivity engineer you know mes and data scientist as required and we provide a technology roadmap and a digital readiness index to the manufacturer right this is where you are today this is your gap and this is recommendations on where to start how to start and this is your why this is a business case of why you should start today and what you should do in the short term and what you should do in the long term so understanding digital maturity and assessing your your dmi your digital maturity index is very key to success because you don't want to go into a plant and start deploying ai on a casting machine okay to do predictive quality and you are not even connected to the machine the connectivity is missing sensors need to be added to the machine i don't even have visibility if the machine is running or if the machine is not running i don't i don't have real time oee metrics on the factory floor so there has to be a gradual and calculated and systematic approach to understand where you are and improve your digital maturity over time. It is a journey, okay? We have to baseline and we have to have a plan moving forward. And the plan uh, most always starts with number one, connectivity. I'm gonna take you now through a short journey actually, and I'm gonna give you snippets on how we do connectivity, how we do performance metrics and analytics using OEE as an example, um, how manufacturing execution systems can support your organization if you don't already have one, or if you can improve what you already have. And then going into predictive analytics and using AI to predict maintenance issues, predict quality issues. And I touched on briefly the academy work, but happy to come back and talk more details. Again, just a short pause at any time, please do not use the chat window. Please use the Q&A section and write your question and anything in the Q&A will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Thank you so much. So let's start our journey with connectivity. This is a very simple statement. Manufacturing data is the foundation to achieve ROI from IIoT and continuous improvement programs. It is only missing two words, actually, right at the beginning. Real-time manufacturing data is the foundation. Real-time manufacturing data is the foundation not manual data, real time. And it's very important to go into a manufacturing operation and understand your connectivity readiness, okay? If you are not collecting real time data from the factory floor, we have to start because that feeds into your visibility, your execution and your predictive analytics. And it provides real time data that is actionable by the team. Real time data comes from your machines and your ERP systems. We have to understand, is the machine capable to communicate? What would it cost to add communication to the machine? Uh, how long will it take, right? Uh, what type of data do I need to capture? This is key, right? How much data is actually available in the machine based on my use case, right? I wanna do traceability for my parts. I wanna know the voltage and the torque and the current. Well, does the machine allow us to do that, right? So there has to be a harmonization between the business use case and the need with the ability of the machine to provide me that data, and then the uh, cost and time benefit ROI. So we've taken all this and we've created a very systematic process to do it. We have a team of PLC and controls engineers that enter a plant and with a, a strong level of seniority, and they spend somewhere between one to three days at the factory, depending on the size of the factory, for example, if you have less than 50 critical assets, it's usually a one day effort and then it grows from there. OK, and they do an audit. They do an in-depth audit that clearly answers these questions and provides a fixed bid and a process on how to conduct these four steps and, and to uh, quickly accelerate the connectivity required in the plant. So it all starts with understanding you know, does the machine have an ethernet port? Can I connect it to the network and get data? Or do I need to add a hardware to the machine? That's a key point, okay? We support many different ways to communicate with the machine. Some are very affordable. Um, you know, we have machines from the 50s or 60s 
with a $300 piece of hardware, okay? $300 piece of hardware per machine made by Siemens actually, okay? It is not a proprietary hardware, it's an off-the-shelf hardware that allows you to get eight key signals from any machine, all right? And give you real-time visibility and OEE of that machine, all right? $300, so affordable sensors and hardware have become extremely affordable. And at the same time, computational capability using cloud and using software has also become extremely affordable. So with this, with this affordability of hardware and software and historians and you using connectivity approaches, this allows manufacturers to quickly get connected with a very strong ROI. We collaborate with the networking team also to make sure you have the drops and the switches in the right place. That is an internal effort, internal cost that we also justify. And then very important, what is the data map, okay? Um, what is my use case? Do I just wanna measure OEE? Do I wanna do traceability? Do I need to do predictive maintenance? That all governs, that business conversation governs the data map required from the machine. Then we go in the machine and we find that data and if needed, add sensors to the machine to get the data. And then we make the data available to an OPC historian, to an ignition-based system, for, uh, as a SCADA, for example. We have no preference. Um, uh, we ask the client if they have internal preference uh, using Kepware OPC, using ignition as a SCADA, just to give you two, maybe like top two examples. But if the client uh, does not have a preference, we make a recommendation an unbiased recommendation based on what we see at the, at the manufacturing plant. So then this takes us to, you know, I got so many machines, I got new ones, I got old ones, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, capable machines, but different ages, different varieties. What do I do? Well, we just group them in two groups. One is the machine is ethernet capable, there is native connectivity, there are drivers, there's about a hundred different drivers that we understand very well. I mean, the top three or four are listed right here using Focus, using MT Connect, using Euromap for injection molding machines, you know, OPC, right? But then group two is your legacy equipment where we need to add gateway hardware to the machine. And the hardware can be as affordable as $300 to $400 to get real-time data from any machine controller. And then that takes us to where do I get the data from and what type of data do I need? And just to illustrate what I said verbally, I mean, it could be as simple as OEE production data. I wanna know if the machine is on, if my cycle start, what is my piece counter, and if the machine has an alarm or a, uh, or a fault code, you know, give me that, right? It could be that simple. Five or six tags allows you to understand in real time, you know, on your cell phone, is my machine running? You know what I mean? Without the need for an operator to write it manually on paper, okay? It is real time. It is not questionable. The data is coming from the machine. And then other things, depending on the requirements, quality measurements, process parameters, attributes. Many companies have a higher level of maturity where they're you know, regulated heavily by BMW or VW or Ford. You need to do traceability of your parts, for example, right? You need a birth certificate. And in order to do that, I need to know for every process what was the torque on my spindle? What was the voltage? What was the current, right? So the data connectivity here becomes more intense, but the ROI is there. The data goes to a data lake that is accessible by any system within your organization in a very standard way, okay? Using uh, OPC or using a SCADA type of historian, you can communicate with your OEE systems, MES systems, ERP systems, and your predictive systems in the future. So now that I have data, I need to do something with the data. Um, you know, we all measure productivity. Shuffler productivity is the tip of the iceberg. We, whenever you enter every plant, you see, you know, Q, C, D, E, S, P, right? Your quality, your safety, your productivity. In many cases, it is printed manually from Excel sheets or ERP systems. That's okay. But how can I now connect my shop floor to the top floor? And how can I understand digital metrics? My machine tells me true uptime, utilization, the deviation between my standard cycle time of my part, usually in the ERP and the actual cycle time from the machine, plan versus actual is your performance metric, okay? This is uh, how fast the machine has produced a part. And if we can optimize our master data, our standard cycle times in the ERP by using real data from the factory floor, 
we are improving costing and we are improving scheduling significantly, right? Sometimes we refer to that as ABC, activity-based costing, all right? And then quality, how many pieces, how many good, how many scrap? What is the reason for scrap? What is the reason for rework? And feeding that data back to the ERP system. So it's important to uh, start thinking about what digital metrics mean sense to your organization and how you can integrate your plan floor to the ERP system to provide a real-time and true metric on the factory floor. So that is performance analytics or performance metrics. When it comes to predictive analytics, going even deeper, I might be running 90% OEE on my machine, but my machine goes down or my machine makes a bad part and that impacts negatively my OEE metric. So how can I use analytics now to go deeper and start looking at the health of my machine? or predicting the RUL, the remaining useful life of how long the spindle is gonna to take to fail or the ball screw on my machine or the joint on my robot axis as it's moving, right? And then my diagnostics, um, what is the root cause? Which axis on the robot is gonna fail? Um, is my spindle bearing gonna have an inner race failure or an outer race failure, right? So performance metrics for historical understanding of what is happening on the factory floor, visibility, transparency in real time, and predictive analytics or metrics to understand future behavior so we can plan forward and start going towards a zero downtime, zero defect operation. And we really think about metrics in four ways. It has to be real time and actionable. It has to be integrated from the plant floor to the top layer, okay? It has to be, uh, you know, best of breed IT products, web-based, HTML5, mobile capable, run it through a browser, okay? And it should be standardized. There are standard OEE calculations that your organization might have. Those should be taken into consideration and it should be enterprise-wide and scalable. A plant manager should be able to see, uh, you know, enterprise plant level OEE. A VP manufacturing should be able to see plant one, two, three, four, five, six, and drill down to understand what is the root cause of issues that are happening on the factory floor. And this is one example. Okay, um, you may already have this, or you may be looking for such a solution. We're in the business to support companies to implement and select the best MES OEE solution for their business. Okay, so this meets the four bullets of metrics criteria that, that have listed up here. You're looking at the real time OEE of a line, you're looking at scrap and performance and availability in real time. You have a planned versus actual understanding of your job progress here. Okay, I'm supposed to make 200 pieces. You know, uh, my target this shift is 48 and I've produced 42 pieces so far. Okay, and then here you see plan versus actual in real time. All right, so the plant management team knows the score within the factory. What is your score, right? You don't need to wait until end of the shift when the ERP back flushes and you collect the paper from the factory floor, right? To feed it to whatever system you have, Excel or ERP and so on and so forth. This is real time connected data rich and allows you to contextualize the data so you can immediately see where you are versus where you should be and take real time decisions. So now that I'm doing metrics, what else can I do, right? Maybe I need support to go beyond OEE. Maybe I need to do scheduling, right? Finite capacity scheduling. Um, my, my OEMs are regulating heavily and require me to start doing traceability of my parts. I need to, co to, to confirm with the BMW requirements. I need a birth certificate of every part and batch that I produce. I need more data now from my machines. I need to know every operation it went through. Who did it? Who made the part? What the machine process parameters were? I need a poke yoke, right? I cannot go from step one to step two unless I meet some process conditions and deviations. And then I need to have a birth certificate electronically saved for 15 to 20 years, which is the life of my automotive program, for example, right? Which allows me to do a, an upstream trace and a downstream trace. If there is a recall or a warranty issue, I immediately have the electronic records that you could look at, you know, the, the, the other transmissions that you produce that may have a similar problem, right? or zoom into that specific transmission and understand, you know, Joe was on operation 20 
and the torque on my spindle was not good. So I made a bad part, which was accidentally shipped to my whatever OEM, right? So traceability we are seeing is becoming more and more of a key requirement. And we have an approach to help you, um, I would say map your, your OEM requirements to the traceability technology requirements and also implement solutions that can integrate in the right way to the plant floor and to your ERP system to provide you a traceability solution that works and that meets the regulatory needs of your company. And then more and more on quality, SPC, statistical process control, process monitoring. This goes hand in hand with traceability actually. The same connectivity, the same data lake, the same process parameters are also used for quality and SPC and are also used in traceability. Uh, lastly, on the maintenance side, in many cases, there is a separate maintenance system you might have. Your ERP might have a maintenance module, but in many cases, maintenance function resides in the MES system, right? Uh, many clients like to have maintenance as part of an MES system as a one solution, one you know, single source of truth, one product uh, made by one company that also allows me to do maintenance. But uh, we're seeing more and more tool management required monitoring the tool wear and the tool life on my machines and my dies and uh, energy uh, for, for green factory requirements, monitoring proper process consumption or power consumption of assets and so on and so forth. So, you know, this is not a big bang solution where we walk in and say, yeah, let's deploy everything uh, in the next uh, three months. This is becoming, this is an output of our digital assessment that allows the manufacturer to understand um, what is a phase approach to do this, right? What do I need today? Maybe I just need OEE and production operation. Maybe in phase two, I need traceability and quality. Maybe in phase three, I need uh, maintenance and tool management, right? It is a phased approach to implementation. It's a crawl, walk, run, and it's implemented keeping the business case in mind and also the recipe for success around technology, process, and people, right? So I've collected data. I've went through the OEE visibility journey. Um, I may have elements of an execution system in place. What else can I do um, with uh, my, my manufacturing facility? Well, now that you have the data lake, you can start going beyond performance analytics and you can go into predictive analytics. Um, you have the data lake, you have relevant machine data. In, in some cases, we may need to add sensors on some of the machines, but there is a predictive engine that allows you to transform that data into actionable information and decisions. Decisions on when is my machine gonna fail when it fails? What are your predictive maintenance metrics? What's your health? What's your RUL prediction? And what is a diagnosis? What is gonna fail and why is it gonna fail? And then for predictive quality applications, I'm looking at the actual health of my part. Every six to 10 seconds, I'm making an aluminum cast and I want an accurate prediction. Is this gonna be a good cast or a bad cast? So I can prescribe to the machine to accept or reject the part and uh, not wait until it goes to machining or goes to paint or goes to my customer because the price becomes exponentially increasing, right? And then if it goes to my customer, I have a problem. So how can I do predictive quality in scrap rich areas? And it's mission critical. I have to catch quality issues right at the source. And the source is, for example, your casting machine or your molding machine. So we are in the business of templates. We are in the business of deploying these solutions quickly and affordably on the factory floor. And therefore we've come up with a library of templates, okay? We've come up with almost 30 templates. Um, you can use your existing data lake and whether the machine is new or old, there's a defined data map of parameters that come from the machine controller and parameters from add-on sensors like vibration, for example. And it allows you to look at your each axis of your robot, for example, and predict issues. It allows you to look at the critical components of your CNC machine, your spindle bearing, your tool using vibration, the coolant, if it contaminates or if it needs replacement, you know, alarm mining. Your machine is shooting out hundreds of alarm codes all the time. What is the meaning of those alarms? How can I mine those alarms and have a causality, cause and effect? You know, these alarms have a pattern and this pattern might mean 
that my ball screw is going to fail on my machine or my coolant has a problem, right? Advanced machining, a lot of predictive quality work, especially on casting and molding. Um, not to mention welding, laser welding, spot welding, uh, recently ultrasonic welding, right? It is not just about the uh, robot joints, it's about the quality of the weld, okay? We even have a project using image recognition and inferring using image data of the weld if the weld is uh, good or bad using image data. Stamping machines, uh, some of them allow us to put vibration sensors while others are sensitive. So the sensitive processes where I cannot mount sensors, we try to do it in a non-intrusive way. We use acoustic data, sound, sound emission. And we put an acoustic sensor at the right place to listen to the sound of the press. And from the sound of the press, you'll be surprised. You know, without the human ear, the, the analytics can listen to the harmonics and it can predict maintenance issues and quality issues of the stamp by listening to the, to the stamping press, for example. Not to mention ancillary components. I have assembly lines and I have safety critical or uptime critical pumps, motors, gearboxes, right? This is more component level analytics. And we're able to go very deep and tell you if your you know, motor bearing is gonna have an inner race failure or an outer race failure if your motor is gonna have a stator winding problem, or if your gearbox is gonna have a lubrication or a backlash, right? So the idea here is faster, cheaper, and scalable, okay? There is no need to hire a data science team and PhDs and invest a lot of money and you know, buy big platforms. Um, of course, we can complement big platforms if you've already made that investment. But the idea here is, you can get AI running on the factory floor in eight to 12 weeks and start generating ROI within three months, okay? AI in eight to 12 weeks without the need of having a PhD or a data scientist in your workforce, okay? And at the same time, have the interoperability to integrate those systems to your maintenance system, to your SAP PM, to your IBM Maximo, to your Infor EAM, and optimize your spare parts and optimize your maintenance scheduling. Two very quick examples, robots. We are very robot agnostic, actually. If you have robots on the factory floor, there are specific data parameters we capture from the robot PLC, and we're able to predict all the issues you see in red here. Belt issues, backlash, lubrication starvation, bearing failures on each joint of the robot. But, but mind you, this doesn't mean that you should stop doing your PMs, right? you're gonna do the right PMs. You're gonna do PMs on things that a predictive system cannot catch. For example, a dead battery, lubrication loss, you know, cable failures and so on. There is no predictive system in the world that would catch that. We are very clear about the type of failure modes that we are able to predict. And, and they are usually high cost, high impact issues, right? And that delivers a, a very strong ROI for the business, okay? Predictive maintenance is never a factory-wide solution. It is a solution, it is a point solution on the most critical assets on the factory floor that are uptime or quality critical to your business. And that's exactly our approach, right? Think big, start small, but it's an 80-20 rule. 20% of your assets might be leading to 80% of the predictive maintenance ROI for your business. And uh, you know we are good at working and finding those 20%, and this is where you start to generate success for your business. But at the same time, you know, technology, process, and people. You know, I have a maintenance team. My maintenance team needs an intuitive way to use these solutions, right? I have to be able to access them. I have to be able to trust the data. I have to be able to see machine health and to question it, to see prediction with an accuracy, and to see a diagnosis, which area of my robot is gonna fail. Oh, it's joint five. That's great. I don't need to go and fix my six joints. You know, 15 years ago at, at an OEM I used to work, we, we go and do a standard operating procedure every few weeks. We change all six bearings on all six joints. We don't care if they're good or not. The early replacement of good parts was actually a hidden cost for maintenance in my operation. But it was a standard operating procedure. We had to do it and we did not reuse the bearings, you know. But now with a system like this, you're putting the right person to fix the job before the machine fails. 
you're, you're fixing the job quicker because you only need to fix one joint in this case. And you are mitigating the cost of replacing good parts before they fail, right? And it has to be done intuitively. I think intuitive user experience is very key. The solutions we work with are designed to have an intuitive user experience that allows a maintenance person or a process engineer without having an advanced degree to work with these solutions. At the same time, you have other types of machines. I have a CNC machine, more complex, a lot of moving parts, right? Um, I got my coolant. I got uh, my tool on balances. There's a chatter on my tool. My uh, spindle bearing has a vibration issue and is very costly. The spare parts are very expensive. Um, I have a feed axis, the ball screw, the linear axis on my machine, right? Usually you have multiple of those on the machine. So, hey, we have a defined approach to do that. There is data coming from the machine. There is data coming from add-on sensors like vibration. You know, we have a defined data map that you see at the bottom here, right? Um, you should not over-engineer those solutions. The science and the art is there, you know? On the spindle, we need a vibration. There's a load current required. There is a spindle RPM required. There's a program ID required. We can get that directly from the connected floor and we can add a vibration sensor on the spindle bearing. We know how to do that, which sensor to use, whether you need to shield the sensor, whether it's wired or wireless. I mean, these are all considerations that the instrumentation team will take care of and then bring the data into the user experience. So now my team members can see my spindle bearing and they can quickly see health prediction and diagnosis. Um, this is a bearing, it is completely different. This is not a robot joint. The prediction is non-linear. The bearing behaves differently than a robot axis. A robot is a repetitive machine. A spindle bearing is running different loads, making different parts. It might be a high mix, a uh, lot of part ID operations on a CNC machine. And then a diagnosis of a component like a bearing can be actually very detailed. So I'm going to fail. This bearing is going to fail at an 8 kilohertz frequency, or this bearing is going to have an outer race failure or an inner race failure on the machine. So how is this helpful to me? You know, some of our clients, they call SKF or they call Timken, the bearing manufacturer, and they actually question this information. You know, it's like my bearing is always having an outer race failure. Do I need a different bearing? Do you need to redesign your bearing? You know, this information is actually key to ensure that you also have better spare parts on your machine. You have better bearings on your machine, a better OEM relationship for the bearing manufacturer, right? To make the machine run longer and make better parts. That's the whole goal here. A zero downtime, zero defect a mode of thinking about your manufacturing operation. So we always like to celebrate success, you know? And again, if you have any questions, just please write them in the Q&A and uh, we'll address them in the last 10 minutes. But as we're kind of closing here, it's, it's always important to celebrate the success. And uh, we're very pleased that the National Association of Manufacturers, NAM, has awarded, you know, and selected, nominated two of our clients the past years. You know, last year was Maxi on Wheels, this year was Bocar. Um, and one use case was actually uh, predictive maintenance of a very critical asset, which was literally from the 1960s, uh, running good parts, making wheels, steel wheels. Um, it, it was a seven template deployment in less than three months. And uh, we are training an internal team actually within these companies who are learning the solution and their center of excellence inside the company can start scaling those solutions themselves across the operation, you know. Um, same case with another automotive OEM uh, or, or tier one that is doing predictive quality on, uh, on uh, high pressure die cast machines where we are making decisions every few seconds uh, with auto part segregation, as I had mentioned a few times. Is this a good part or is this a reject? And, and the ROI is tremendous. You know, there is an ROI from uptime improvements and spare part improvements regarding predictive maintenance. And there is an uptime regarding uh, scrap reduction. Um, I mean, these are real numbers from the industry. You know, in a, in a mid-sized casting plant, a 1%, a fraction, 1% scrap, scrap reduction is almost a 250K per year per plant in annual savings. You know, that number in its own is your 12-month ROI for the whole investment of services, connectivity, and the software that goes with it. So we, we actually codenamed this project the power of 1% because a fractional improvement can lead to significant ROI in your business.
right? So please write your questions in the Q&A and I wanna start summarizing the presentation and just quickly, quickly announce a new solution that we introduced, which uses analytics in a more innovative way. And the analytics here are more focused actually on employees, okay? Um, it is supporting smarter and safer access of employees within the factory. And as an option, you know, offering contact tracing of the employees as well, okay? So we view this solution as an employee health and wellness solution, which can support you now and can also support you in the long run as an employee health and wellness solution, okay? So what is the ROI here? The ROI is uh, employee uptime, right? It is not asset uptime, it's people uptime. It is improving productivity of employees. It is reducing sanitization costs that may be meaningless or, you know, contact tracing a massive number of people and shutting down plans and shutting down lines, right? So improving employee uptime requires a few things. It requires you to self-assess the employee before they enter the factory. It requires temperature screening right at the factory in, uh, source, right at the entrance of the factory and measuring the vital signs. It requires uh, maybe in the future uh, less, but nowadays compliance with social distancing um, and in some cases contact traceability. But I would say one and two are key requirements for a standard, uh, smarter and safer access to the manufacturing plant. And, and therefore we actually used our analytics engine and we put a solution in place that can do this very quickly and very affordably. Within two to four weeks, you can get started, okay? Within two to four weeks, you can use the app or you can use a kiosk hardware right at the entrance of each one of your factory operations. And uh, existing hardware you have can be used and can be connected to the system very quickly. And uh, you, uh, let me, I'm just gonna mute it. And uh, you know, actually this is an example from an automotive tier one client we're working with. Um, this does facial detection, it does mass detection, it does temperature and vital screening within seconds and feeds data to your HR and payroll system, okay? This is not a siloed solution, it's integrated with your HR and payroll system. You do not need someone to be at the door writing things manually or the lock sheets, right? This in ensures that uh, employees that are safe and well enter the factory to improve safety and wellness in the operation, right? Um, so an integrated solution, very, very low cost and uh, quick implementation time. This is actually an example of a journey uh, from the automotive tier one supplier. And we plan to do a webinar with them in January where they will actually share their success story and uh, will be published in a, in a plant engineering magazine. And there is, there's quick decisions within seconds. We actually feed data to the turnstile that opens the factory and allow the operator to enter or the person to enter. And in other cases, we would unfortunately block and uh, you know, alerts will be sent for, for quarantine if required. But everything you see here, you know, detecting the face, detecting if there's a mask, that's optional, temperature, vital screening, um, turnstile integration to open, uh, accept or reject accessing the plant, uh, clock in and clock out data and even temperature data is sent automatically to the HR system. You know, this is HIPAA certified, this is GDPR compliant. We do not save private data. It's privacy concerns are you know, anonymized and mitigated in the system. That's a key uh, requirement for this type of solution. And all the above happens in about four to five seconds per employee, okay? So in seconds, you have a real-time solution running in the plant and offering you analytics around what is the health of your location? What is the health of the employees? And as an option, uh, the contact tracing feature, of course, only within the plant. The privacy here is, uh, is very important. And we're happy to come back and show you the details, you know, reach out one-on-one -on -one and we can demonstrate the solution for you. Um, but there are uh, pre-built HR and, and EHS and management reports and dashboards that allow the HR and EHS teams to quickly have access to this data and integrate this data in the HR and payroll system of your organization. Um, in addition, um, there are multiple options here, uh, but what you get is usually the kiosk at the factory entrance or a mobile application. 
that uh, answers the survey questions, does the temperature check, facial mass detection, and then entering the operation. Um, it can be hosted on your private cloud or on our secure data cloud. And of course, the uh, wellness AI recommendations for HR and EHS. Um, so we're, we're very proud of this actually. And uh, this has been scaling quite fast in the past six months since we've introduced it. And our clients are not just seeing this as a current COVID pandemic solution, but they're seeing this as a long run health and wellness solution that ensures that there is safety and health within my operation, right? So I can run my operations with uh, uh, making good parts and continuing to have a high OEE and high uptime in my plant, right? So the standard package is where we're seeing a huge interest where other plans are upgrading a bit to include contact tracing, that's uh, optional. And then we're seeing some interest to start using also image and video analytics as part of the system uh, in, in other countries. Short summary, and then I'd love to answer any questions you have using uh, the Q&A. I see a few questions there. Um, a short summary is really, uh, you know, this slide here. Um, you know, our approach is, is one, two, three, okay? Discover, design, deliver, one, two, three. Find your proof of value. Assessments, discovery is very important. Understanding your digital maturity, understanding your readiness, that usually takes a day at the plant, okay? In many cases, that's, that's at no cost. It is an investment on both sides to run these assessments. That goes into a workshop, a technical workshop setting, which might be a digital assessment. It might include a connectivity audit, that provides a very clear statement of work, hardware, software services that allows you to embark on a proof of value where the deployment timeframe is somewhere between eight to 12 weeks, turnkey, including getting connected, including the hardware and software needed and the training required um, and achieving the business case that we had promised uh, from the beginning. And you run the pilot for about three months after which you can scale the solution yourself actually you can scale the solution using your internal center of excellence that we would train, um, or we can help you in scaling the solution. But uh, it all starts with understanding your digital maturity, your digital readiness, finding the right proof of value, and keeping in mind technology, process, and people, right? That's your recipe for success. And that's actually what this slide says. Um, you know, it's, uh, we do a lot of things, a lot of good things with uh, many great clients and, uh, uh, there is always a way to, to think big and start small, but to act now, uh, to remain competitive in a very competitive market space, um, to think about a proof of value that aligns business with technology, okay? Uh, to have a zero downtime, zero defect vision of the way you want to do things uh, in the short term and in the long term. Um, we did not discuss smart connected products today, but if anybody on the call, you know, has uh, sensorized uh, products and is looking for an analytic solution to, to offer new business models for their customers, like uh, makers of machines, OEMs, or pumps, or motors, and so on and so forth. Uh, in many cases, we've uh, private labeled our solution, actually, and the analytics engine is being used to provide subscription services and remote monitoring and diagnostic services uh, for smart connected products. And lastly, uh, please always remember benefits only accrue as far as the weakest link people, process, technology, and it's important to assess and understand where you are uh, so you can pave your journey forward. Please contact me anytime, actually. If you're in front of a computer now, just uh, drop an email, abuali at iotco.com, and happy to have a one-on-one -on -one 30 minute conversation with you, uh, learn more about your needs and get your feedback about this webinar. We do have a few minutes and uh, there was a few questions, actually. One question was around, uh, how to calculate the ROI for the implementation. And uh, we actually have a way to do business case justifications. We have an ROI calculator even that we share with clients. Um, it, is, it is focused around the metrics that are meaningful for your business, impacting productivity, impacting OEE, impacting spare parts, uh, impacting maintenance scheduling, impacting quality, right? So it usually revolves around the OEE, MTTR, MTBF type of metrics. Uh, reach out to me if you're interested to see the ROI calculator or if you're interested for us to come up with a specific ROI calculation for your business. And uh, we can easily share the ROIs of, of many of our clients, actually. 
do you have any case studies in uh, the mining uh, environment? Um, in fact, we do. Um, I did not show this today, but uh, we have worked in the past with uh, Komatsu. We've worked with PNH Mining, which is now owned by Komatsu. Um, it was not. It was not only on their factory floor, actually. It was on their smart connected products. Um, you had Komatsu engines and excavators that are out in the middle of the desert doing mining, and it's it's difficult to maintain those machines. You know, you have to send somebody out in the middle of nowhere. So the machines came with a built-in data logger, and every night a satellite connection opens because um, internet is is difficult. You know, you can't get internet in the desert. So there was a a one-time satellite connection every evening, and uh, in the evening, the data goes to their spare part system. Our analytics are running there. And then we make decisions whether you need to maintain the engine or you need to maintain the tires or you need to maintain the uh, battery on the excavator, right? And then maintenance gets dispatched. So it was a smart connected product in a very extreme environment, but it was very successful. And uh, I believe they continue to use the knowledge until today. If there's any other questions, uh, you know, please drop me an email, um, abuali at iotco.com. Uh, we will share this presentation with everyone, also people who were not able to attend. And uh, I do appreciate everyone's time. I appreciate the partnership we have with uh, the Charlton Group, um, working on the Charlton companies, and uh, looking forward to uh, have more of these webinars on a monthly basis in 2021. And we will actually have an invited speaker uh, next year um, as part of our webinar series, which will be a monthly series. Have a great day and uh, uh, stay healthy. Happy holidays. Thank you for your time.